thanks again, uh, Felina and Marina, who uh, gave us our two first uh, presentations and, and conversations. Um, we'll continue now with uh, Elise uh, Misa Hunchuk, uh, who, who is a Berlin-based uh, researcher, editor, uh, educator, trained in uh, landscape architecture, but also philosophy and geography. Uh, and her practices uh, engages with uh, transdisciplinary uh, exploration of relationship between landscape, infrastructure, process, natural processes, human and uh, more than human uh, landscapes, uh, and, and so on. And I, as I've been uh, saying earlier, I will just do uh, very brief uh, bios uh, for guests uh, since we have them uh, on our on our page. But I. I I had a pair of uh, Elise with uh, which I'm also meeting for the first time. So thanks so much, Elise, for for joining and accepting the invitation. Um, that uh, I pair Elise with with the question of landscape uh, and uh, as a kind of a broadly construed uh, concept, uh, because in once we we consider some of the uh, conversations being, uh, and points being made here, uh, perhaps even particularly just recently by Pelin, uh, uh, the, the way that we consider territory and building territory and producing territory, producing space, uh, inevitably we will engage with the, as well the question of landscape. La landscape as, as an active uh, element that shapes, but also can shape uh, other communities, relations, uh, and so on. So um, I think it was a great uh, Topic to to include in the kind of public commons uh, and and the making of, of those together. So, I will uh, welcome uh, Elise and uh, pass it on to you. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. Hi everyone. Um, so. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I wish I could be there in person. Of course, I'm sure everyone says that. That's like a default response now, uh, but it's true. Um, and also, um, I'm just I guess I'm just very happy for the um, opportunity to join you um, from here from, I'm normally in Berlin, uh, but I'm uh, joining you from Milan uh, during the lockdown, this particular period of lockdown. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm also really, um, I'm a bit disappointed that I didn't uh, get to see um, the previous um, conversations, but, um, hopefully I can stick around for more of them um, because I was, you know, really, first of all, really intrigued with the list of um, people who are coming here today um, on Zoom. And then also I was really intrigued when I first re received invitation because I was, um, you know, immediately wanted to talk about this idea um, of commons um, in a different way, maybe than we normally talk about it in landscape, uh, landscape architecture, especially. So, um, you know, um, the, the brief and the invitation for the day was evoking you know, rivers and ecologies, um, shared spaces of these kinds. And um, so today I thought maybe I would share um, two landscapes that I've been thinking about. Um, and maybe this can, um, yeah, this can start a, a conversation that we, we then carry on. Just to confirm, I have 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, yeah? You could, uh, let's say we have, that That was a kind of an initial idea, but feel free to okay. move it around, take more, and then we can keep, yeah. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, so, you know, we're gonna talk about some common landscapes. Um, and so maybe it'll help us think a little differently about them, um, maybe. So I'm just gonna um, share my screen. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> not yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I signed in on a different, my different Zoom account because my other one sort of locking me out. Um, how is this? Good? Yes, that's good. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> unfolding, um, oops, no, that's not right. Also new keyboard. <laughs> uh, so do you see a slide now? Yes. Yeah. Let's okay. see the line. 
Perfect. So unfolding um, shortly, uh, page by page, um, although it's currently only existing in digital form uh, and not yet printed, is an incomplete atlas of stones. I'll tell you a bit about it. It's a six year project and it started back in the summer of 2015. Uh, in the summer of 2015, I traveled to known tsunami stones along the San Riku coast of Japan to explore what I thought at the time uh, was the importance of on-site research and of bearing witness. Two things that are not quite possible today, as we all know, of course. Um, and it was through, um, I would say, an unplanned mixed method of research, archival, fieldwork, interviews, mapping, and documenting that I came to compile what you see now, this incomplete atlas of stones, a kind of visual document as a way to unfold or see the Japanese archipelago's unstable mineral base. It was an attempt um, for me to try and understand, but then also illustrate the dynamics of the coastline as a place, uh, a shared place. And this is, of course, not to say that this is the only way to do this or this is the right way. Um, this is just one way because, as we all know, um, or as we come to know, landscapes agency can be revealed in many ways. So this atlas is organized by Tsunami Stone and it follows the coastline of the Iwate Prefecture um, from north to south uh, along the San Riku coast of Honshu. Um, it's also a record for me of 50 days of travel of 75 sites along the coast, but it's also the coast itself. It's a landscape that's complex. It's a responsive artifact of materialized memories and cultures and built form. But I've also made an assumption in starting to tell you this. What is a tsunami stone? So hundreds of years before, uh, in the wake of the 869 tsunami, uh, along the same, very same coast, communities began to erect stone tablets called tsunami stones. You'll see them appearing intermittently on the left-hand side of your screen, removed from their landscapes, removed from their context. Um, these stones performed a dual function. So they were warnings, they were um, markers of the edge of inundation. So they indicated where to build and then where to flee when the water rose. Um, but they're also monuments. So they're, they were and are erected as part of a ritual that memorializes geologic events and those lost, including uh, humans and animals and buildings. Um, there are hundreds of these stones along this particular part of the coast. Uh, they range in height from a few inches to a few meters. Um, I've seen up to four meters, almost four meters. Um, rising from the earth, many were placed uh, in the landscape, as I said, either to mark the height of an inundation line, of the flood line, or to mark territory above the flood lines. The messages inscribed on the stones, they vary from stone to stone. Um, because each community utilizes them differently, sometimes as a memorial, as I mentioned, uh, but sometimes also as recorded predictive knowledge, uh, and sometimes it's both. Um, and so in 2011, some villages um, and towns um, heeded um, the messages not to build below these stones, um, and some did not. Um, but in this now telling you of this part of the story of what a tsunami stone is, I've also made another assumption that you know um, precisely what happened on March 11th, 2011. Um, and so um, many of you may know some of the details, but perhaps I'll share with you um, what I've come to know um, to help further position this um, as a response. So, <clears throat> On the 11th day of March in 2011, at 2.45 local time, so in the middle of the day, uh, the early earthquake warning system of Japan um, activated more than a thousand seismometers that exist throughout uh, the nation. Uh, it sends immediately uh, a warning to its population, so to millions of people. Um, 60 seconds later, uh, so the warning time is up uh, around 60 seconds or so. Uh, and 60 seconds later, the 9.0 magnitude 
undersea mega thrust, thrust earthquake hit Japan. And it's the most powerful earthquake to have hit Japan in recorded history, um, which extends from the year 499. Um, a second warning was issued uh, that a tsunami event was likely but not certain. And so, you know, as, as what happened was as the earth moved near where the plates of North America and the Pacific plate meet, um, there was an undersea landslide that was triggered and it was so large uh, in its magnitude that it quite literally displaced the Pacific Ocean. Um, and so between 10 to 30 minutes later, the times vary along the coast, the earthquake tsunami event that we now know of occurred. And so many, and in many locations, locations that you see here appearing over and over again, um, up and down the coast, the swelling of the ocean was exacerbated by too high or too wide seawalls. Uh, and so rather than dispelling incoming energy as they're designed to do, the incoming energy that travels in through the water, um, the seawalls trapped the tsunami waves and it intensified the swells and currents and actually exacerbated what was happening. Um, and so what happened was the height of the water actually moved higher and faster than it would have had there been no seawalls. Um, and it inundated over 500 square kilometers of land. So a significant portion of, of this uh, territory, this landscape. Um, these tablets that mark the edge also of the 2011 tsunami are part of a shared multivalent knowledge um, exchange through time and space. And so there are another 500 stones planned uh, for erection in the coming years. Um, and as Japan continues to build almost 14,000 kilometers of seawall, um, the critical in understanding or in attempting to develop an understanding, a shared understanding, that this crisis, this particular crisis facing the coastal landscapes of Japan, for example, is a shared and ongoing project and it's not limited to the aftermath of emergency. So that's one landscape that I wanted to share with you. Um, and shortly um, I'll, on your screen, you'll see part of a documentary film um, that's been made over the course of the last year during this COVID era. Um, and I'd like um, to suggest that while you're watching it, that you, you think of this as another kind of commons. It's not a landscape per se, or in the traditional sense of the word as, as we've talked about it. Um, but it's certainly a shared uh, space, um, commons, that's constantly, continuously interacting and exchanging and commingling uh, with all landscapes. Um, and that is, of course, the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is this commons that we walk through every day. Yeah. Um, but before I tell you this particular story, um, it's important for me to highlight that the work that follows this um, has been done and continues to be done through um, a series of collaborations and collaborative relationships. Um, first and foremost, with my co-tutors at the Royal College of Art, so Marco Ferrari and uh, Cyan Cheng, um, as well um, of two years of, well, now two years of, of student cohorts. Um, and in particular, the film that you'll see was made in close collaboration with students, three students from our first cohort, uh, Nico Alexandrov, Henry Valerie, and Lena Geertz Dano. So, the atmosphere. In our work, we're exploring it through a stove, but not just any stove. Of course, it's a cloud seeding stove. And this stove is uh, a discrete object uh, built, replicated, and placed throughout the Tibetan plateau. And it's where and how the physical embodiment of a project that I'm going to tell you about, the Sky River, um, both, um, and the Sky River is both a phenomena and a project. Um, this is where we see it for the first time embodied in, in any landscape and in particular this landscape. So in the troposphere, a slight moment of science for you, in the troposphere, which is the lowest region of the atmosphere where we live, 
Um, water exists, uh, water vapor exists in the form of what are called filamentary structures. Uh, and they're in a state of constant flux. Uh, in 1982, a group of scientists proposed to call these filaments tropospheric rivers, as they had the characteristic of rivers that we know on land. So water gathers to move in uh, what they write as, quote, lengths, many times their widths, and they persist for many days while being translated through the atmosphere, end quote. And so for us as the domain where different vectors of the current climate crisis are meeting and interplaying uh, and where conflicts around its policing are beginning to emerge, the atmosphere also produces these multiple localities, sometimes shared and sometimes not, um, where these transformations can be observed and sites and thereby sites of interventions that we might imagine. Um, and far from being understood in all of its complexity, of course, the atmosphere continues to elude our ability to model its dynamics. Um, of course, we have um, some crude computations, um, but we are not you know, uh, able to, with anything approaching accuracy, uh, to co compute future scenarios, for example. And so this ongoing research um, project centers around um, China's Sky River project. Um, it's a large scale weather modification project that aims to address the ongoing and increasingly severe water shortage in North China. Um, <clears throat> basically, um, what's also important to note is that there has been for over 50 years, uh, a north-south water transfer project that's been under sort of constant construction and expansion. Um, but that in all of its um, extreme you know, size, volume uh, and abilities is still falling short of the needed water. So <clears throat> it's in these processes of precipitation and evaporation of this, this phenomena called the Sky River um, where those who studied and named it also believe that there's a new possibility um, to address the shortage of water. Um, and they're calling it, they've called it the Sky River Project and its testing site that we find on the Tibetan Plateau. Um, and broadly speaking, um, the Sky River uh, Project is meant to intercept uh, water vapor that's carried by the Indian monsoon over the Tibetan Plateau by using cloud seeding uh, stoves on the upper slopes of mountains that are firing silver iodide um, to modify the spatio-temporal distribution of precipitation, so to modify where it rains. Um, and what they do is they use a combination of, and are using, uh, a combination of military rocket engine technology um, with the stove, a ground-based silver iodide generator. Um, and as I said, they're installed on mountaintops in strategic positions um, where they're exposed to upward winds that can theoretically uh, carry their exhaust into cloud formations above to trigger rain. Um, this ground network of what is meant to be tens of thousands of stoves is planned for deployment across the plateau and it's making it the world's largest and most ambitious cloud seeding project to date or experiment, pardon me. And this attempt to claim and manipulate uh, atmospheric water as a resource is taken again from the recognition that groundwater resources in China, uh, particularly in the Yellow River watershed, have reached their limit. So the very idea that atmospheric water vapor can be thought of as a river, um, thereby projecting this three-dimensional uh, metaphor, um, also that we use in, in the language of the commons, um, onto a four-dimensional cloud topography, extends the control of our cartographic imaginary, um, and it's worth exploring. Um, it occupies a void in a domain that lacks a clear legal framework, a space that's mostly unregulated and without definite borders, while it actively erases from the map local communities, which have been living in these areas prior to the advent of the various state organizations that are conducting these experiments. So our work is trying to ask, 
or understand how the atmosphere is becoming a space that can be mapped through scientific research, that that research is then appropriated through technology and administered through both land and geospatial infrastructures. Because ultimately, the exploitation of the atmosphere fosters change, sometimes significant, sometimes not, at the ground level. Um, new lines on the land are ostensibly drawn by this changing geography of the sky in the form of displaced rainfall, fortified glaciers, floods, or even chemical alteration, uh, as is the case of, of the silver iodide, um, of the water bearing stratum, so of the clouds. So the Sky River is producing and shaping new planetary imaginaries, especially those that extend our concepts of land sovereignty up and, to, up and into the domain of a common shared atmosphere. Um, and so perhaps with like, uh, perhaps with that I might stop. Um, and then, um, so it's a lot of me talking. Um, and I'm, I'm very curious um, for us to talk about this, um, this idea of common atmosphere, um, or this sort of shared space together. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Elise. I, I have a, maybe an initial first uh, question, comment, uh, in part reaction um, to that maybe you can uh, address. And you, one of the things that I think in, in terms of what I have learned from your practice combines uh, the principle of, uh, of observation and on site, right? That you, um, mentioned also in your uh, in your intro uh, and 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 now for example if i think about the second project uh that second project kind of uh i guess utilizes other instruments right other other forms of vision to to document and, and perhaps even kind of visualize uh most likely this uh this idea of the sky river and so on and um uh, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on the idea of if, if what would be the kind of uh, notion of observation or on-site, uh, if at all, related to the project of, of the Sky Rivers? And, and if there is a kind of correlation that helps us think or, or kind of bridge the notion of the abstract scale of, of, of clouds and an atmospheric uh, landscape into uh, the one that, right, the kind of first layer of air that we inhabit as per your quote there, which is beautiful. Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, I think the first project, the, the, uh, the tsunami stone, right, kind of really uh, embodies the notion of, of observation in landscape and on site and, and, and learning from it. And this one is kind of producing another scale of, of looking at things. And maybe you wanna, or you can elaborate a little bit on that relation. I'm, I'm happy to. Um, it's also something we thought about a lot, obviously. Um, it's also wrapped up in a lot of, um, so there's a lot of questions there, I think, actually. Um, but maybe I'll start with maybe um, the more practical ones, which is that um, when we first spoke about um, collaborating on this particular research question, yeah, to look at this particular project, um, we had actually every intention of going to the site. Um, because we are um, in our in our various separate practices on our own already very interested in um, field work, <laughs> on-site work, um, careful on-site work, uh, which is to say always in the effort right. of either like collaboration or just that there's a kind of exchange yeah that it's not just a sort of one-sided extraction of information and, and and whatever the case might be um so there was always that hope um or that plan rather which turned into hope uh, as soon as um as as covid uh sort of began to unfold in in december when news really first came of it uh to europe yeah um uh, and then, and then, um, so so there was this idea of that. Okay, we might do it. Um, okay, let's let's maybe defer that part and initially focus on just trying to understand. So let's like readjust our expectations. Yeah, the the questions that we're asking. 
So maybe it's more about understanding the technicalities. Yeah, the technicalities and, and not only that, but um, the infrastructure, um, the very um, sometimes opaque and sometimes not um, earth sensing systems that are being used or being developed specifically for the purpose of this project, for example. Um, uh, and then, you know, good old fashioned, you know, internet scraping, you know, like all of these things that we were trying to do as a way of this, like reshaping um, how we were going to maybe model out this research um, project, so to speak. Um, and so, and so then the idea of fieldwork was uh, pushed a bit. Um, and then, uh, of course, you know, with all these like lockdowns coming up and down and up and down, um, there was always like a moment, there was always like this forever deferred moment of hope, kind of like, you know, communism or something. Like, it's just like, it's always in the future. There's always this possibility <laughs> for this thing later, you know, um, it'll be better later. Um, and of course, this kept happening over and over again. Um, and so um, we're kind of in this endless loop. Yeah. Um, because the idea is precisely that there needs to be a kind of um, there needs, in this case, they're, they're really, and especially because of the site uh, being on the Tibet Plateau, that there does need to be this kind of um, at least conversation with those who are um, either there or familiar um, and so on. So there's no happy answer for us yet. And it's, I think it's still something that's being developed a work in progress maybe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but i but i do think it's it's important to think about but then i then i have to say also um it also makes me think that this kind of forced slowdown this this uh lack of choice we're presented with <laughs> provides us with an opportunity to actually be better uh we not better researchers, but more um, thoughtful, more careful, because instead of just rushing to a place and trying to, you know, interact and gather and ask questions, you are kind of, um, you can take advantage of this, this time, this pause, this very long pause, this extended pause, um, you can take advantage of it to learn as much as possible from afar, with as light a footprint as possible, right? Um, that's not to say you'll ever get a complete picture. I don't think actually, I think it's a bit naive to, when we talk about it, to think that we'll ever get a full picture of a place, you know, uh, but um, we can do our best to be like, you know, good partners or good collaborators um, and, and learn as much as possible before then, you know, showing up and asking all of the questions, right? So maybe it's more about learning as much as possible in order to ask the most right questions in that particular space and time. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, I know, absolutely. And, and I will follow up with, uh, there is a question maybe by Manasa, you wanna make it yourself, uh, uh, you can unmute. Yes. Um, hi, Alice, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, it was really nice. Uh, I didn't know a project called Sky River existed, so I'm gonna definitely gonna look more about it. So my question is, uh, what are your recommendations to protect the vulnerable communities that are often affected by such projects? Uh, sorry, did you say vulnerable communities? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think this goes to, um, well, first of all, that's a very good question. <laughs> and then second, that um, speaks to something I referenced um, very briefly, um, which is to say that there's a real lack of um, regulation or legal framework about um, what gets taken out of the atmosphere. Yeah? So there's a lot to say about what gets put into the atmosphere in terms of pollution or this sort of thing. Um, but a lot less um, in terms of what's getting extracted, like a resource, like water vapor, simply because it's not necessarily been the case before, yeah? Um, so, so there's this sort of question about, um, there's like sort of first principles, yeah? Like there's just, there's no regulation. So 
that's a uh, regulation or sort of international agreement or international law, right? Um, that we would presume, or I think, again, that might be naive, that we would hope would protect vulnerable communities. But I think that's a place to start, right? Um, and I think that, you know, the other, there's, I mean, this is a bit tricky in this particular situation also, because the other question is, what communities, um, what and who are the vulnerable communities in this particular case, right? Because also, I, I should also say that, you know, despite this massive um, project that's ongoing and has been ongoing for some time, the efficacy is not proven, right? So that it's working is not known. <laughs> There are some assumptions that it's working, but the idea is that there will be, you know, this thousands upon thousands of stoves. Right now there are about 500. So it's not even known if, you know, if, if this will uh, actually cause any change. There's a lot of assumption built into um, a lot of the conversations around the project as it is. Um, so that being said, we can't, can't really and truly project or understand if it's really going to, for example, um, will it directly affect those on the plateau? Will it affect those who, because it's an intercepting of monsoon water, will it affect those further down the watershed, right? So these are all, there's just, there's almost too many moving parts to even know who the vulnerable community might be in this particular case, if that makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. The, there, was a, <laughs> there was a little bit of a follow-up question with that. I think it might have been, uh, you know, you have covered uh, a great part of that. And then there's an, uh, another one by uh, Luisa. Uh, Luisa, are you there? You can feel free to maybe elaborate on that or or just maybe at least uh, the question is based on right what what did the communities get from you in turn uh, as field work or or, or, or such uh, which I think is a critical question always right uh, telling was also uh, uh, asking or, or kind of you know working with that around and, and Marina earlier with how uh, as, as practitioners as that is I would say researcher academics and, and practitioners also of creative fields uh, participate in this, right? I think there's a there's there's always this tension between what is the kind of relation in between the object of, or subject of study and then one as researcher. So maybe I will let you elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, no, um, thank you for the question, Louisa. Hi, I see you in the video there. Hi. Um, and so, uh, the, so I want to be clear and say that the only fieldwork that's happened um, to date would be the fieldwork that I did uh, in Japan um, as, a, as a thesis student in my master's. And so, I mean, this is a much larger conversation, but I'm also happy to have it because I think there's not um, a good and clear answer on this. But, um, you know, we're often asked and I don't know if this is the case there, so I'm also making some assumptions, but we're often asked to talk to people, right? We're often told to engage with community. We're often told to, you know, there's, of course, there's participatory engagement. That's a different thing. But, you know, we're often told in our research that we should talk to people. And I have to admit that I, one, I felt very uncomfortable doing that because, one, uh, I'm not trained in any way <laughs> to, um, you know, uh, interview people in the sense that, you know, in this sort of uh, ethnographic anthropology, like, there's just, I have no training. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I know only slightly more now. Um, and so the other realistic, um, uh, the other realistic point is to say that a lot of the sites I went to were still empty at the time. So a lot of the places that I went to where there were um, tsunami stones, um, they may have been um, in uh, former neighborhoods, but a lot of those sites were quite empty of, of people because a lot of those sites were at the time in 2015, still under construction or reconstruction at the time or cleanup. 
Um, and so there was not a lot of interaction in the, in the villages, in the towns. Where there was a lot of interaction uh, was with other researchers. Um, and I have to say librarians who were extraordinary and really saved me uh, in my time in Japan because um, there they also have, um, uh, it's called a, well, one, a lot of the researchers um, were engineers working in engineering, civil engineering. Um, and then the other is that um, the librarians, they have a disaster, a national disaster library with a team of researchers. And so um, they also, on top of that, it's a bit fragmentary answer, but I just want to put all the parts out for you because there's a lot of moving parts. The other is that there's um, this, uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. I know it's in the States and it's quite prominent, but the Japan Foundation, um, which is, it's, it's meant as, it's an incredible foundation if you're interested in anything Japan, um, because really they act as, um, as a kind of facilitator between Japan and it's kind of like the Goethe Institute for Germany. Yeah, very similar. Um, okay, I'm getting a lot more nods on that one. So that's good. So, um, so this is how they function. And so I did contact them before I left uh, Toronto, which is where I was studying at the time. And they were extremely helpful in reaching out to different um, libraries and towns and this sort of thing. Um, and so the long answer, or the short answer is no, I, I didn't pay anyone. But uh, what I did do was share information I found uh, and, and all of it. Um, so everything that I was able to pull together was shared with them in, in a, because one, they asked for it. Um, but two, it also doesn't exist in English. So there's bits and pieces of this information out there in Japanese, um, but not all together, not in English and not in this particular kind of visual way. Um, and so, um, I was more than happy to to reciprocate with this. And that was partially, I have to be honest, um, was partially why I put the atlas together, was a way of, of sharing it and not just for my own research purposes, but also with others. And so um, recently I was like, I, I have to admit like really touched when um, some um, local community groups in Tohoku, like, so the region um, along the coast, um, like shared on Instagram, that they actually were using images of the stones that I had collected as a way to commemorate um, um, the day and those lost. And so that was, um, yeah, that was a big sigh from someone in the audience. <laughs> um, does that uh, does that answer your question, Louisa? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> No, of course. I mean, I would be interested to know more about, I mean, if anyone on the call on the call on the foundation has their own experiences from or as a student, you know, in the, in the field <laughs> with the people. I don't know if I'm hoping you can't learn here, but, but I, I think it's it's worth talking about um, or thinking about how we how we work with people. Yeah, and I, and I think that that, that was, uh, I mean, I really, I really appreciate that response as well, because there are, um, it's, it's a challenge that we all confront when, uh, when kind of, as, as researcher practitioners, academic, right, it's almost like we're always going outside to either learn from something or document something, right, and, and, and it, there's always a feeling of, of kind of extraction against somewhere, right, and not participate or not engaging. And, and we, you know, we most likely saw with Pelling uh, a very kind of engaged practice of, uh, of almost really sharing uh, and spending time uh, with, with a specific location and building relations and so on. Um, but I think in here, uh, I, I wanted to bring a, a concept that uh, Pelling also mentioned that was the, the cultivating of uh, something uh, permanent, not necessarily the building of something permanent, but the cultivation of permanency as a kind of, as a, as, as a building of infrastructure and relations and community building. And and I think that the how you responded by combining uh, what you're also by giving back uh, in terms of 
uh, even the kind of challenge, technological challenges that you say you confronted, right, and how do you kind of need it to negotiate uh, not being able to do observation, but also uh, or engaging with these other forms of, of, of vision to, pre to create uh, kind of m mostly in the second project, right? Uh, but I think that is, a, that is a, 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 an interesting practice, and, the, and in terms of the kind of notion of cultivation, and the other one is, um, which a little bit has been also on uh, on the table today, is uh, the practice of archiving uh, to an extent and collecting. And I think that uh, one of the things that I also appreciate about your work was that uh, you use uh, visual documentation, photography, and, and audiovisual media uh, also as a way to to engage with the places, with the landscapes, uh, with the memories. Uh, and I think that was a that was a great kind of uh, added uh, sort of value to the work. And, and I'm glad you kind of mentioned that uh, that it was even used in, in some other form. So um, I, I think there is something uh, very kind of strong in that notion of uh, creating uh, collections of things, creating archive of elements and things. So um, if if maybe. Uh, I have maybe one more kind of follow-up uh, little question um, about uh, the the tsunami stones. Um, I, I are, uh, because it wasn't maybe clear, absolutely clear to me. If you made uh, the atlas of them of, of maps that also uh, locate them, and and are are they inscribed into a kind of contemporary logic? of let's say uh, we, we live surrounded by kind of data maps uh, that tell us about the scope of risk, right? And I wanted to introduce risk a little bit in here because uh, because of the notion of tsunami and tsunami stones as a kind of, it, it, it's very kind of, it's a beautiful kind of uh, gest gesture, right? And, and of creating this. But is there a correlation of uh, those uh, very kind of, um, I would say maybe analog practice, right? It's a kind of very different kind of social practice versus contemporary ways of producing maps and information. Uh, is there a dialogue between those contemporary or not? And yeah, I'll stop there. Um, is the question, is there existing a dialogue or? <laughs> yeah, if, if it's existing or, or if, I don't know, if through your project or something else, uh, it's been built or not, or it doesn't exist, or maybe there's no interest in connecting. It, because it's a question about, uh, I, of course, I'm completely unfamiliar to, uh, to landscape in the context of Japan or something, uh, other, uh, other place that I am unaware of. Um, but thinking that since there are, right, uh, very strong relations to the production of landscape and, and, and also, I guess, the, the, the management of landscape and, and, and controlling landscapes, uh, if there is a correlation between that and contemporary modes, uh, mostly technologically driven uh, modes of understanding those, I'm not sure if there are or not relations. No, I think this is um, I think this is an important question, and I uh, it's it's funny because I I usually bring up the word risk on my own um, because I have to be honest and say that. Um, my, uh, generally speaking, my practice is built around landscapes of risk, um, you know, how, how they're understood, um, of course, how they're documented, how they're um, both at the time, of course, and then after the fact, and also before. Um, and then also understanding how this kind of risk gets flattened or erased, yeah? And so I think, and this really struck me, um, this question, I have to say, first came in this particular formulation to me only after I, I went to Japan and only, I would say, months after I really had time to absorb what was going on. Um, because at the same time, you know, was there a direct dialogue? Um, I think the answer would be, generally speaking, no before 2011. And I even think, you know, immediately after, it wasn't necessarily a large dialogue, but what I found, because when I went in 2015, a lot of people, and by people, I, I'm also referring to a lot of um, like extended family and friends in Japan. So I'm, I'm also um, part Japanese. And so, um, and so a lot of people had no idea what I was talking about. When I asked them, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm here to look at tsunami stones. They were like, 
we don't, we don't know what those things, what are you talking about? Um, and I had to show them the New York Times article that I read. I'm like, what these things, these things that are apparently everywhere. And, you know, that also is another story about uh, Western media and extrapolations that are made, but okay, that's for another conversation. Um, but then what I found really interesting is that the, com the references began to appear more and more, both in Japanese and in English media, um, as the seawalls were being reconstructed. So basically, as I, and, I, and I realize I gave you a very condensed sort of um, presentation of this, but um, in essence, what happened is that um, Japan uh, has some of the largest or had some of the largest and deepest seawalls. Um, extremely highly engineered uh, coastal landscapes um, meant to dispel incoming energy, right? So incoming waves, tsunami, so on and so forth. And as I said, most of them failed uh, in the face of this particular tsunami because the force was just so large. It had not been engineered for, it hadn't been calculated for in a lot of cases. And so the things that are meant to protect you are precisely what uh, make everything so much worse and in fact amplify the risk. Um, and then there's also, and so so there was that. But then there's also this, um, something I didn't quite understand until I was actually, this is where going to a place becomes important, is when I was actually walking in uh, Kamaishi, uh, which, uh, many of us saw images of this city um, when they were playing, you know, showing scenes on the news because basically it did have the lar world's largest, deepest seawall. And um, what happened was that there was also this sort of seawall that ran around the periphery of the bay um, in the town. And so people were filming the tsunami from rooftops and they were watching it slowly fill up like a bathtub. Yeah. Uh, and Everyone can see, you can see it watching the video, they can see it, but all of the people on the ground behind the seawall that is many meters high can't see what's going on right beside them on the other side of the seawall. And so you have cars and people milling about. They're obviously trying to get out, but they don't understand the urgency of that particular moment. So um, this sort of uh, blind spot, this massive blind spot that gets put in place is no longer a metaphor. I mean, it's also a metaphor, but it's also not a metaphor. Um, and so you saw these like extraordinary responses from engineers, which was to like cut like little holes of sort of like at the height of one's head, if one were walking behind the seawall, they had these little holes cut. You can see like these remarkable images online, um, which then also makes me ask the question, does that not disrupt the efficacy, but okay, fine. I'm not an engineer, maybe I don't understand, but um, but there were these like small sort of acknowledgements that there was this kind of need to see, the need to understand imminent risk and one's surroundings, yeah? What to me is so fascinating about the stones, so it's a bit of a long answer, but to me what's so fascinating with the stones is that if you understand what they are and you understand why they've been placed there, Right, which is to say, don't build below this line. When there's a tsunami, when there's an earthquake, there will be a, there's likely a tsunami. They have this kind of language on them. If there's an earthquake, there's likely a tsunami, evacuate above this stone. Then you can know based on your relationship to that stone or where you know that stone to be, uh, ostensibly, where to flee in order to be safe or at least as safe as possible in that moment. And so this kind of like, this ability to evaluate risk for oneself and also for others, I think I didn't quite fully understand. And of course, I, I'm not saying I fully understand it now, but I understand it a lot more now based on this kind of embodied experience of this place, yeah? And of course, then we can also, you know, this is of course an extreme example, but then we can also think about these different types of embodied risks elsewhere when we think about things like flooding, yeah, or earthquakes or forest fires or, or, or when you start to understand the conditions of your surroundings or at least how to 
uh, how to read the conditions of your surroundings, right? I mean, this is always, almost always the problem. We sort of engineer ourselves into thinking that we're safe in so many of these, especially in urban areas, right? We think we're safe. And then of course, we're absolutely, we're often not. Um, and we also see that play out in a very different way in a different scale, I think, in terms of this sort of analog um, COVID, during COVID, yeah? You're constantly having to reevaluate this understanding of risk in relation to constantly changing inputs or information that are, you know, both like quite like most physical. I mean, you know, I'm able to not wear a mask because I'm at home by myself. And, and of course, like I'm able to register where you are in a shared space because you are wearing a mask. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is a very simple way of of putting it out there, but it is a way of understanding one's exposure to risk through these kinds of either gestures or um, gestures or acts or rituals, if that makes sense. Absolutely, and I will I will use that uh, end, ending on on the question of risk. Uh, and I'm kind of of course this is so awful that I cannot necessarily smile. I'm kind of outside with not too many people, but. Uh, um, I, 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 I will use that as a kind of closure uh, uh, and for this part as we move on to our next one uh, in a minute. I'll just take a moment to go to the restroom in my marathon. Um, uh, also, we are under the risk of thunderstorms uh, here, uh, which is just a kind of a casual uh, uh, take on this, the reason that we are in a different space. Um, but uh, thank you so much, uh, Elise, for your presentations. Really, really. Uh, uh, exciting and, and kind of challenging questions and topics I don't I was completely unfamiliar and I, and I, I know that the relation between you know atmospheric thinking and, and, and landscape is something uh, that we should all be paying more attention but uh, I, I really appreciate the kind of non sort of climate change driven nature of, of how to look at the atmosphere so um, thank you so much uh, for joining uh, me today and uh, I hope to see you later soon <laughs> in other context. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Sure. Great. Thank you so much. While we wait for uh, our next uh, guest, I'll, I'll just uh, leave the image here up and be back in just two or three minutes. Maybe I'll leave the birds uh, on.
Okay. I'm back. Uh, let's see. Hello, Brian. Thanks for thanks for joining. No problem. Uh, so um, we'll continue with our uh, four guest. Uh, today and we uh, most likely are shifting gears a little bit uh, to some of the uh, initial conversations that we had around uh, institutions about commoning and, and, and social practices and, and more just recently with um, landscapes and, 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 and multiple scales, uh, all in relation to questions of how do we make and build 